We are now live on YouTube. Meeting is in session. Hello and welcome to the Capitola Planning Commission meeting of November 3rd, 2022. In accordance with the California Senate Bill 361, this is a hybrid meeting with commissioners and the public attending both in person and remotely via Zoom. Information on how to join the meeting using the Zoom application or a landline or mobile phone, along with how to submit public comment during the meeting tonight is available on our website, cityofcapitola.org, and on our published meeting agenda. As always, this meeting is cablecast live on Charter Communications Cable TV Channel 8 in the City of Capitola and on Channel 25 throughout Santa Cruz County. The meeting is being recorded to be rebroadcast on the following Monday and Friday at 1 p.m. Meetings can also be stream li streamed live on YouTube or on the city's website. Our technician tonight is Eric Johansson. And now let's move on to the roll call. Commissioner Christensen? Here. Commissioner Newman? Here. Commissioner Ruth? Here. Commissioner Westman? Here. Chair Wilk? Here. Please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. <laughs> Item two is oral communications. Are there any additions or deletions to the agenda? There are no additions or deletions to the agenda this evening. Okay, we'll move on to public comments. This is an opportunity for the public to uh, speak for up to three minutes on items that are not on the agenda. Um, if there's anybody who wishes to make a general comment, now is your time. Please come forward to the podium. Or if there's anybody on Zoom, please raise your hand. We have five attendees on Zoom, no hands are raised. Very good, let's move on then to commission comments. Any commissioners comment on items? Very good, so how about staff? I did wanna inform you that um, come January, we'll have updated technology for the sound system integration <laughs> after, I think it was two meetings ago that we had some issues followed by other issues at City Council. So we're going, we plan to continue to go hybrid, but we're investing a little more money into our system to make sure it's less, less flaws come up and that there's more interaction with the members on Zoom. And as a reminder, when the public does come up to speak tonight, to have them please speak <coughs> into their microphone, so into the microphone so that the folks at home can hear them as well. Very good, I'll try to remind them. Okay, let's move on then to approval of minutes. We have three minutes um, that we need to approve or review or comment on. Any comments on the minutes or motions? I'll make a motion to approve the minutes of August 18th, September 1, and October 6th. Do we hear a second? A second. We have a first, uh, we're at a, we have a motion by Commissioner Westman and a second by Commissioner Christensen. Are there any other comments? Uh, let's have a roll call vote then, please. Commissioner Christensen? Aye. Commissioner Newman? Aye. Commissioner Ruth? Aye. Commissioner Westman? Aye. Chair Wilk? Aye. The meetings are approved unanimously. Let's move on to item four, the consent calendar. These are items to be taken all at once. And there are two items, El Salto and Capitola Avenue, uh, a uh, permit, a building permit and a, and a continuance. Does anybody of the public or the commission wish to take any of these off the consent calendar? Mr. Chairman, I'd ask that you take them one at a time because I cannot vote on these. Okay, let's just talk uh, firstly then about 602 El, Salt, El Salto Drive. Does anybody wish to uh, make a motion on that or take it off the consent calendar? I'll move approval. We have a motion to approve El Salto. Do we have a second? I'll second it. Um, a motion to approve by Commissioner Ruth, a second by Commissioner Westman. Uh, any comments? How about a roll call vote then? Commissioner Christensen? Aye. Commissioner Newman? Aye. Commissioner Ruth? Aye. Commissioner Westman? Aye. 
Chair Wilk. Aye. Uh, item B, 401 Capitol Avenue, you need to recuse yourself? Yes. Okay. So now we have four commissioners willing to vote on that or able to vote on that. Are there uh, any comments or is there a motion? I move for continuance. Uh, motion to continue a second. I'll second it. Second motion and a second uh, to continue uh, 401 Capitola Avenue. Uh, no more comments. Let's have a roll call vote. Commissioner Christensen. Aye. Commissioner Newman. I recuse. Commissioner Ruth. Aye. Commissioner Westman. Aye. Chair Wilk. Aye. Okay. Consent calendar is approved. Moving on to item five, public hearings. This is uh, <laughs> where we get a chance to talk about the items one at a time. We'll go through five items. Uh, staff in order, I mean uh, staff presentation, questions from the, the commission, then public comment, then deliberation, and finally a decision. Our first item is 935 Balboa Avenue. Do we have a staff presentation? Yes, thank you, Chair Wilk, and uh, good evening, commissioners. Let me set up for one moment here. <clears throat> All right. This is 935 Balboa Avenue. The item before you is an appeal of an administrative denial of a tree removal permit to remove one eucalyptus tree within the multifamily low density zoning district. This evening, we will describe the tree removal application process and present the appeal. Next, the appellant will be given the opportunity to speak and answer any planning commission questions. The chair will then open up the public portion of the hearing and that will be followed by planning commission discussion and decision. The proposed tree for removal is a mature blue gum eucalyptus located um, on both properties at 935 Balboa Avenue and 1001 Balboa Avenue. This tree is part of a, a larger grove uh, of eucalyptus trees separating Cliffwood Heights and the Park Avenue road going down to New Brighton State Beach. The subject tree is approximately 135 feet in height with a large canopy, some of which extends over both of the residential structures at the aforementioned properties. The tree is not located in an environmentally sensitive habitat area. It did come up on question if there were monarchs in this area and, and we haven't identified them at this site. This is something we can come back to reference if we need to, but it's a uh, sort of the layout of, of staff process. When, when we can make findings on a staff level to approve removals, that that process would go straight down from pre-application staff evaluation findings for removal um, the formal filing of an application and then finally staff posting the site to publicly notice uh, most tree removal permits are reviewed at that level at the staff level um, they begin with a preliminary review from the public works staff who can approve the removal of non-heritage trees only if the findings for removal uh, contained within our community tree and forest ordinance uh, are or can be made. If the findings cannot be made, the application is transferred to the planning department for the review. The city may require the applicant to pay for an arborist under contract to the city and, and provide a report for the tree. The community development director will then make a determination based on the findings of the arborist. A pre-application was submitted in 2020 with an arborist report dated from 2019 that was prepared without any city involvement. That initial report recommended the retention of the eucalyptus tree. Staff uh, subsequently visited the site and did not see any changes to condition of the tree um, since that arborist had come out and inspected it um, and subsequently was not able to make findings. Um, in 2022, approximately 18 months after the first review by the uh, unaffiliated arborist, the city contracted a second arborist to assess the tree. The city arborist also recommended that the tree be preserved. Following that second review, staff formally denied the application, which was then appealed by the neighbor uh, in September of this year. For the planning commission to approve the removal of a non-heritage tree, 
At least one of the findings for removal must be made and there must be no feasible alternatives. The findings, which include the health and of the tree, safety considerations and property damage are shown here. Uh, they will be in addressed individually by the uh, following slides and you can refer <coughs> back to these if need be. On the first finding for the health or condition, staff and the arborist found the tree to be in good health and, and good growth. The codominant stems are of the, the eucalyptus tree here can be a structural concern, but in this case were found to be in fair condition. Um, and the arborist reported a low likelihood of a complete failure. There was further no evidence of any decay or disease or, or decline of the tree. With respect to safety considerations, the arborist found that the tree poses a low safety concern without mitigating action. Hanging dead branches over one inch in diameter uh, were recommended for removal, but other than that, the arborist found that the, in addition to the main stems being not a safety consideration, he found that the live branches were posed a low likelihood of, of breaking. <coughs> With respect to property damage, or the likelihood of, of substantial property damage. City staff and the arborists found that the tree has not caused and is not likely to cause unreasonable property damage. As mentioned before, there is hanging deadwood, which has the possibility of causing some property damage. In, in addition to that, there was some sections of fencing at the base of the tree, which have been lifted and damaged as a result of the basal growth. The concrete patios mentioned in the appeal in the backyards of both properties show cracking, but staff and the arborist did not believe this appeared to be caused by root growth. It would ultimately take an excavation to explore and find out what the ultimate cause was though. A couple photos shown here were submitted by the appellant uh, at 1001 Balboa Avenue. That's the, the sections of fence, fence that were referenced. The patio here is on the appellant side and it shows the cracking and, and sliding there. This finding uh, pertains to the feasible alternatives to removal, which is something that uh, cannot be met in order to approve the removal of the tree. The arborist found that there were feasible alternatives short of removal uh, available to this, uh, including the removal of that dead wood to reduce risk of any droppings, uh, the selective thinning on the larger limbs to reduce the weight of those branches and, and further reduce the dropping of live branches, and the consideration of cabling of the main stems to um, reduce any potential for the main stems to fail. With that, staff uh, recommends that the Planning <coughs> Commission <coughs> uphold the city determination and deny the appeal. Available for any questions. Question. Thank you. Questions of staff? Uh, yeah. uh, if uh, we allow the removal, what would the replacement requirement be? So that that was something that came up earlier. The uh, there's a fence line behind this house, which doesn't seem to accurately represent the boundary of the property. The property appears to extend uh, considerable ways, about 40 feet, into that eucalyptus grove. So uh, in spite of the fact that this is already a large lot, there is a substantial area on that lot that is completely covered by canopy. So even with this removal, it appears to be about 30%. It's so there would be no replacement requirement? That was our initial assessment. Thank you. Other questions? All right, let's move on to um, public comments. I was going to say, I think uh, if the appellant wants to speak, that would be the first. All right, let's start with the appellant. If you could come Please. on up and speak into the mic. <coughs> Good evening. And thank you for giving me the opportunity to uh, speak before the commission today. Um, my name is Mo Hassan. I'm one of the owners of um, 1001 Balboa Avenue. Um, I have been a resident of Santa Cruz County for the last 24 years. Um, I own several properties in Santa Cruz County. Um, I'm not against trees. 
Um, I have a garden. I love gardens, except in this case, when we bought this property, um, this tree was there, was a huge. Um, we tried to address it, um, except it's really not on our property. It's on our neighbor's property, which is 935 Balboa Avenue. I'm the owner of 1001 Balboa. It's not a, pro a tree that we share, except because of its size, because of its huge, humongous, colossal size, it has overgrown and it has overgrown to our property, to where now it has damaged the fence and it continues to damage not the only the fence, but it's also encroaching as um, Mr. Sean mentioned um, on the, uh, what we believe is um, the uh, patio, which is cracked. Um, and also the size of it is 140 feet long, uh, tall. That's 10 stories building in a backyard, okay? Um, as it was mentioned, the lot has tremendous amount of canopy cover because we are right on behind um, Park Avenue and you have all that eucalyptus grove. Um, we have maintained some of those smaller trees on our side, but again, in all honesty, the two pictures that you saw do not provide 10% of the justice of, to give you an indication of the size of this tree. I am afraid for my tenants, for my property. I currently have renters there. I don't wish to have them there the whole time. We eventually gonna use that house for ourselves, me and my partner. The tree drops branches, small branches, leaves. We have dealt with that. The question is what happens with if there's a big branch that comes down. Um, what happens if, yes, the arborist says that it is healthy right now, but is it gonna be healthy a year from now? We don't know. It has a split. I have submitted to you, and I don't know if you have read over my appeal papers and 12 points indicating why I believe this tree should be removed, that we have gone through this uh, legal process following the city's um, tree permit process with the approval of the owner of 935 Balboa. Two year period. And the discussion with the actual new owner of the property at the time, uh, Joe Stokely, started in late 2019. Then we were hit with COVID and then we had a stop, and then we started the process with the city of Capitol. So over almost it's gonna be three years trying to just gain a permit to remove it. Um, if there is a need for a replacement, we're more than happy to do a replacement, but something smaller, maybe some fruit trees, something that we will, everybody will benefit from. There's a letter that was sent from one of our tenants also to the city indicating um, the threat that they see from the tree. Um, I'm asking the commission to reverse the decision of the city on denial of the permit. Please, I wish, I also had asked today is that if you were willing to come and see the tree in your, with your eyes, um, I had asked the uh, tenant to provide permission and they did. And I was expecting hopefully that you would be able to before this, this meeting that you would come to the backyard and see it and tell me if this is something that you would be able to live with. Now, I have a very good neighbor with Joe has been cooperative in this process. We have worked together on this. But maybe I would have had made different decisions if it was in my backyard. But this is obviously history and right now, removing it, we need a professional company, they need a permit, you know the process. We don't wanna do anything that is gonna jeopardize or increase the risk of anything and we see that there is a risk with the maintenance of this tree in its position. So um, I'm appealing to you again as a 
as a resident, as a homeowner, as a concerned citizen, that this tree, yes, it has been there for a long time, but it has, time has come for it to be removed because of the potential danger. We see that uh, there is a clear and present danger to the property, to the residents there. It may not happen now, it may not happen this winter, but with the climate change, with the storms, with the weather changing, I don't know. I see it. It's huge. Again, I just wish that you come and see it. The pictures I've, I've provided, um, you know, several pictures in the packets that I hope that provided you some kind of idea, but it's uh, nothing close to uh, compares to actually seeing it in real with your own eyes. And I don't know if I would need to go over the information that has been uh, already submitted to you. I don't want to take all your time here, but um, I, you know, there's, there's an issue of the tree uh, encroaching on the property. Um, I don't own the tree. Um, I don't want the tree to be encroaching on my property. I don't want it to be um, breaking the fence. We can't have a neighborly fence because the fence has been uh, broken by the tree. It's actually the, the tree is, is pushing it over. Um, trimming it is a short-term solution, and it's not the solution. And we're looking for one solution to this that will end it. And it's not going to be by any means a low cost reasonable solution it's a okay. huge tree we, we have we have had a chance to review the, the packet and your information and we really appreciate um, your information and all the hard work you've done and are there are there any questions of the applicant while he's while he's here um, I have a question yeah um, are is there anybody that values the tree in your neighborhood that you know of that has anybody besides you and your neighbor have it has anybody come, you know, for again for, for, for maintaining it? For it? I mean, is no. anybody else bothered by it, or is it? Oh, is, every, uh, is there anybody else that is bothered by it? Uh, my two tenants mm -hmm. that uh, live uh, on, on, on the properties, and uh, obviously the, the owner, Joe Stokely, and his tenant as, as well. Okay. I think so it's a duplex. Was, is there any neighbors that have objected to the idea that you would take it down? No. No, other we, questions we did not get. I right, thank you very much. Let's let's move on to other. No, I don't know if there's anybody on uh, Zoom that wants to oh. talk. Well, I think we can continue but the public hearing. Yeah, move yep. on to public okay. comments. Yes, from uh, from other uh, other members of. The, thank you. You may sit down. Thank you. Um, uh, other members of the public wish to speak on this issue. Now is your time. Um, please step forward and. Um, step forward to the uh, microphone and uh, is there a, uh, a sign-up sheet there is if you could if you could just for, is, yeah, sign so for the minutes it's good to have uh, your uh, your full name uh, Jim so Florencio Williams and you have uh, three minutes to state your case yeah, um, I've been living at 935 Balboa since 2015. Um, that tree's been loved by our family. We care for it. We, uh, it's been um, constantly, uh, they come out and do some treatment every year to make sure it stayed healthy. Um, it's a beautiful tree. I mean, it, it's part of the ecosystem there. I mean, it's been there. It's probably the oldest thing on that hill and it's gorgeous. I mean, uh, we could be afraid that the airplane's gonna fall in our yard tomorrow too. I mean, I mean, things can happen, but that tree has been inspected several times over the years. And uh, all the arborists that have seen it and commented, they said it's very healthy, it's in good shape, and there's no need to remove it. So I don't know what the problem is with the tree. I mean, <laughs> it's just a tree. All right, thank you, Mr. Williams. Anyone else? Chair Wilk, we have um, 
five attendees via Zoom, one would like to speak. It's number two, Tony S. If he would unmute, he now can speak. Hello, can you guys hear me? Yes. Okay, so it's hard to hear everybody, but I'm also the co-owner of this property with Mo and um, you know, we've really looked at all our options and avenues in terms of, of making this work, but the reality is, uh, you know, this does present a danger. Now, uh, with the climate changes and all that, one big storm can really do a great damage because it is a big tree. It, it carries a lot of weight. Um, just, a, I would say, a major windstorm would easily break a few of those branches and cause damage. Now, I understand one of the neighbors saying, you know, it's not a danger. Well, if it's on his property, he wouldn't say that because obviously it's not on his property. He doesn't care about the danger that happens directly on the two direct properties that it sits on. So for us, we're trying to be proactive rather than going the legal way and, and, and you know, wasting your time, wasting our time. We're trying to be proactive in terms of really addressing the issue before it happens. Uh, and I think that's the, the smart approach, the savvy approach in terms of really rectifying something that you could probably see may cause a you know great either danger or damage. Because again, with its weight, with its size, it can actually cause more than damage. But potentially, who knows? Depending on who's sitting in the living room and the branch falls in the living room, it could potentially cause you know a death. So again, we're being proactive. There's a thousand other trees right behind it. We're not taking away from the looks of the area. We're not taking away anything from the environment. Uh, I think we're just, again, being proactive and, and doing the right thing for the better rather than, you know, keeping it and just procrastinating and hoping, you know, nothing will happen, which, which we don't want to go that route. So, again, understand that, we're, again, we're taking the proactive approach, the smart approach that keeps everybody safe, healthy and hopefully no major incidents um, that will reduce the cost from all aspects, from a homeowner perspective and the city's perspective. Um, I think we've all seen the damages that big trees can cause when they do fall. So, you know, the further away from the actual structure, I think the better off we are. So I hope you would take that into consideration. Of course, nobody has inside information. Nobody knows what's going to happen. But we know we do get major storms throughout winter. And a lot of times we carry heavy, heavy wind, and really that would be the big factor that we would be more concerned with. Thank you, Tony. Thank you. Other comments? Anything from Zoom? Mm, nope, no other hands up from Zoom. Okay, so we'll close then public comments and- I'm sorry. There is another Zoom hand up. Okay. Um, Joe, you can unmute and speak. You have three minutes. Hello. Good evening, commissioners. Can you hear me? Yes, Joe, we can hear you. Yeah. Anyway, well, thanks for uh, taking the time to everybody here to talk about the tree. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a beautiful tree. I think it's the nicest tree in the whole grove there. Um, but as my neighbors, uh, Mo and Tony, uh, when we first purchased the property a few years ago, they were real concerned about it. Um, and uh, yeah, but there's been several arborists that have um, come and uh, done studies on the tree and, and they all say it's healthy and everything like that, but it, but it is a ginormous tree. It, it's as big as a redwood. And um, I think uh, they and, and, and I are just concerned that, um, you know, if, if it ever did fall and land in the way of, of the properties of the homes there, it will cause a lot of damage. So like Tony is saying, we're just trying to do the right thing and be proactive and go through the, uh, the proper channels. So um, that's that's what our motivation is here. And uh, I just want to say thanks for taking the time to listen. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Joe. Okay. Let's then bring it to the commission for deliberation. Anybody want to comment on this one? I'll go. Go ahead. Okay. So first, I want to say that the staff, our staff, uh, handles these tree applications very consistently and thoroughly and fairly. Uh, they are bound by the what I consider to be a very rigid statute that doesn't really take enough uh, 
variations into consideration, but that's not their fault and they apply it as they see it. I think we as a planning commission have a little bit more discretion. Um, my concern here is, well, first of all, Mr. Fouts' uh, report, I, I, by the way, I did look and I think probably most of us went and looked at the tree from the street. Mr. Fouts report uh, rates the danger, uh, the risk of the tree as moderate. So to me, that needs to be balanced against uh, the nature of the tree, which is one of a huge number of eucalyptus trees in that area. So that uh, if it were some other, um, not, not a heritage tree, but some other species of tree that maybe was uh, more um, uh, unique or needed or necessary or less plentiful, maybe the standard for risk would be a little bit different. But for me, the fact that it's, that there's tons of eucalyptus trees out there and uh, they'll get big too over time, I think what causes me to, to balance this in favor of removal. Even though the risk isn't huge, it's enough given the fact that it's one of hundreds of eucalyptus trees in that grove. Thank you, Ch Mr. Newman. Anyone else? Go ahead, Nick. Yeah, I went out Tuesday afternoon and looked at it peeking over the gate there. And was my, my concern was that it might be a major part of the whole eucalyptus forest and leave a big hole in it. But it looks to me like it's kind of an outlier towards the Balboa side. So that eliminated that concern I have. And, you know, recently the commission just approved two very visible public trees to be removed at the end of Wharf Road because they dropped pine needles and caused some minor damage to the sidewalk. Uh, and some people that supported it got a better view. <laughs> but, you know, th this tree, I think, uh, probably with the potential for the property damage and the damage that's caused right now and the fact that it's not going to really impact that whole urban forest there, I could support removal. I think we need to be consistent and that would be consistent with our prior decision. Uh, yeah, uh, I agree with Commissioner Ruth. Uh, I did go out and look at the tree as well and this one does seem to be forward of the main grove of eucalyptus trees. And um, uh, I think that uh, removing this tree is not going to have a huge impact on the um, canopy that uh, runs along there with all of the other eucalyptus trees. And I also agree with Commissioner Newman. I think the staff did an excellent job on going through the process and uh, evaluating the tree. Um, and if I had been in their position, I would have come to the same conclusion based on the findings that they have to make. But uh, for us, we have a little more flexibility so uh, we can make a finding for removing the tree. Courtney? I, I agree with everyone. <laughs> There's, um, I've lived under eucalyptus trees in the past and every year is a new branch or deadwood or something falling and it just seems that even if you were to remove it one year it would be happening the next year after um, and so I would I would support removal okay I also uh, would support removal the reason well I visited it not only did I visit it from the front but I went around the back from Park Avenue and climbed that little hill and <laughs> walked waded through the forest and it's a big beautiful tree uh, it's very healthy. Um, I was the one who asked the question about the monarchs. If it was to be a monarch grove, it, it just would be, you know, certainly uh, part of that ecosystem. But as it was pointed out, there's no history of that. Um, so, uh, you know, I would tend to want to agree with staff. However, as Commissioner Ruth pointed out, there's precedent that's been set recently on uh, on trees. Um, you know, he and I both have been trying hard to save trees several times <laughs> and have been shot down. And the reason is because, uh, well, first of all, safety first, right? We've had a, a redwood tree on 47th Street that uh, we voted to save, but it was uh, overturned by the city council. 
because of safety damage and basically big trees are dangerous and this is a big dangerous tree from that standpoint even though mitigation can be done but you know you're talking about serious expense putting cables in removing constantly moving dead wood this and that I uh, hate to put the owners through that expense unnecessarily especially as Courtney pointed out it's still going to be a problem so um, the safety issue seems to be one that we're going to continually come across whenever there's a big tree and I think the City Council even if we try to save a tree is going to say no safety, safety first um, finally there's the, the other thing we're supposed to consider is, is uh, structural damage and that was the reason uh, that we um, we approved the um, removal of the uh, canary pines on Wharf Road because of the sidewalk was damaged and the curbs were lifted and this kind of thing and that was going to continue to be a problem well I mean those are safety problems that could could easily have been handled with just shaving down the sidewalk nevertheless that's you know that in the pine needles is what uh, what got those those trees removed and so so I can I can look at the fence uh, being a structural problem, it's a, it, you know, you constantly have to worry about the fence and the property line. And I, I looked at that patio from, from behind, and, and to me it looked reasonable to assume that that crag did come from the uh, roots of the tree. So, you know, how do you dis distinguish between a lifting patio and a lifting sidewalk? So I, to me, I think in order to be consistent, uh, we need to uh, follow the... Um, the precedents that have been set, especially recently. Uh, it's also a non-native tree, so that kind of weighs against it. So uh, I, I also, uh, I think uh, I'm with the, with the rest of you in terms of thinking that uh, as beautiful as a tree as it is, and it is, I mean, it stands right out, um, it, it's, uh, it's not worth keeping. So I'll move uh, that we accept the appeal and allow the tree to be removed. We have a motion by Commissioner Newman and a second by Commissioner Christensen. Any further discussion? Let's have a roll call vote. Commissioner Christensen? Aye. Commissioner Newman? Aye. Commissioner Ruth? Aye. Commissioner Westman? Aye. Chair Wilk? Aye. Uh, uh, appeal is approved unanimously and go ahead. Um, I would like to read some findings into the record for this. Um, so what I'm hearing is that the removal of the tree is in the public interest with respect to the condition of the tree. The tree does possess a safety concern without mitigation. Um, that the removal of the tree is in the public interest with respect to unreasonable existing and potential property damage. And that there are no feasible alternatives to the tree removal since securing to secure the purposes of the community tree and forest management ordinance. And we'll put those findings um, into the minutes that you'll review at the next meeting. So the findings were for denial. So I wanted it's to. Fine. Everybody okay with that? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. That clarifies things. So with that, uh, we can move then on to item B, which is 216 Central Avenue. Do we have a staff presentation? coming right now. All right, thank you. <coughs> this application uh, before you is for a design permit, historic alteration permit, coastal development permit, variance and minor modification for a single family residence project is located at 216 Central Avenue within the single family z residential zoning district. This is a couple images of the, f the residence as it appears today. Um, different shots of the, the front elevation there. Um, it's located in the Depot Hill neighborhood on the corner of Escalona Drive and Central Avenue. The site is adjacent other single family homes, the historic Casablanca apartments, as well as the Inn at Depot Hill. The applicant is proposing first and second story additions and modifications to the historic primary residence. This proposal does not include modifications to an existing detached garage in the rear. 
This is the proposed site plan. The additions for both first and second story are shaded in blue uh, and they are distanced from the front elevation along Central Avenue. With the additions uh, totaled, the proposed project is 2,267 square feet for a floor area, excuse me, a floor area ratio of 50% or 50.5%, which conforms to the maximum floor area ratio of 52% for the lot. I'm going to go through the existing and proposed elevations side by side, uh, starting with the above, which show the front or west elevations. This is the most publicly visible elevation. Uh, the applicant is proposing additions which are stepped behind the ridge of the cross gable to create added depth. Most modifications will not be visible from the street level of Central Avenue. Uh, and we've got some renderings to show you uh, at the end of the elevations. Exterior cladding on the additions are horizontal wood lap board. The boards will be differentiated in width from the original and existing boards in, on the front section. These are the north elevations which face Escalona Drive. They are also uh, publicly visible. The uh, section on the left on the proposed is what would be new and modified. The proposed design replaces a previous addition on the rear of this structure and it also replaces a loft portion above. This is the interior side or the south elevation. And this is the rear or east side elevation. As I mentioned, the applicant had included a, a number of street renderings these are both taken from Central Avenue. The one on the left is from the uh, intersection of Central and Escalona, just to give you an idea of uh, what the, the massing may look like from the street. So as mentioned, this does include a historic alteration permit. Some of the context behind this, this home is that it, it actually used to be 112 Central Avenue. It was located about a block down towards the ocean. That red line indicates where it came from. In 1999, 2000, the city approved an application to relocate and uh, construct additions to this home. It also included a variance to place the detached garage, which is still there. Because the relocation and, uh, and of the structural modifications, the historic status was in question and subsequently reviewed in 2020 by architectural historian Leslie Dill. Ms. Dill found that the siding was still to be within the context of the original Hind development era of Depot Hill. This determination was later supported in an attached letter by local historian and former architecture, architectural and site committee member Carolyn Swift. Following that and submittals of uh, designs for this uh, edition, architectural historian Seth Bergstein provided a preliminary review, which included several recommendations, including reducing the second story mass and, hiding, uh, mass and height from 27 feet to 25 feet, beginning the second story addition behind the ridge of the cross gable, insetting the second story additions behind the eave line of the original cross gables as viewed from Central Avenue as well as differentiation of the cladding from the original house to the additions. Subsequent revisions incorporated these recommendations and following those design changes, Mr. Bergstein found the project in compliance with the Secretary of, uh, Secretary of Interior's standards for rehabilitation and as well as the California Environmental Quality Act. For the variance and minor modification, I'm sharing the findings from the staff report, but I can also read you what, the, uh, what they represent if you would like, um, and we can also reference them here. The existing residence is within the minimum front setback and is considered non-conforming. The proposed structural alterations with this project would exceed 80% as uh, described by our calculation and uh, as was reviewed by our building official. 
uh, and that's 80% of the present fair market value of the existing structure. Therefore, the applicant is requesting a variance for the construction cost calculation formula and limitations for non-conforming structures. In relation to the variance request, staff was able to make findings supportive of granting a variance for the non-conforming calculation. Findings A through F are captured on the, this slide and the next slide, and I can uh, go through them if you'd like, but I'm going to move on to the next slide here. These are the uh, findings D through F. The application also includes a request for a minor modification for the covered parking dimensions. The proposed additions exceed 10% of the existing floor area, which requires that the applicant bring the parking into compliance with all development standards for parking. The existing garage is less than the required 10 foot deep or 10 foot wide by 20 foot deep uh, space as is required to meet the covered parking requirement. Because the existing space deviates from the required dimensions by less than 10%, the applicant is seeking a minor modification for the minimum covered parking dimensions. The site plan here shows what the proposed arrangement is of, of a total of three parking spaces. The two on the left and, and lighter orange are the uncovered spaces, and the one on the right and the darker orange is the covered space uh, located within the garage. John, can I ask you a question about that? Is, is yes. That any difference in the existing parking out there right now? Is the parking being modified at all because of this improvement to the property? The parking area of the uncovered spaces would need to be modified, but the existing garage and, and driveway is, is otherwise just going to be built into. The site plan above shows that arrangement as I uh, just uh, described. And for reference as well, because it relates to some of the findings for the minor modification, I have the side or the front and rear property line dimensions there showing that the, the lot does even visually taper down towards the parking area and driveway and that um, moving the garage forward as it cannot be moved backwards would actually make it difficult, uh, uh, maybe infeasible, to put a second uncovered parking space in the front as they've currently proposed. That is included in, in the findings, which I have for you now. In relation to the minor modification request, staff was able to make supportive findings for the minimum covered parking dimensions. Uh, as with the variance, findings A through F are captured on two slides, and we can certainly go back and cover them if you'd like. With that, staff recommends the Planning Commission approve the project based on the findings and conditions of approval. Are there questions of staff? Seeing none, let's move on to public comment. Do we have the applicant here wish to speak? Are there any other members of the public wish to speak on this item? We have uh, three attendees on Zoom, and I do not see any hands up. The, I will say, though, oh. that the architect is online um, if you do have any questions for them. Actually, a hand just came up on Zoom. <laughs> so. Okay. Um, Bridget Etsy, Esty, um, I, you can now speak. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Um, my name is Bridget Esty. Uh, my husband and I have properties on uh, both Escalona Drive and Central Avenue. Uh, the property on Escalona Drive looks directly at uh, 216 Central Avenue. And we just wanted to, um, just for the record, let, uh, let uh, you know that we do uh, support the improvements, the recommended improve, uh, proposed improvements, and we think they've uh, done a great job of um, meeting all of the, um, the, the rehabilitation um, criteria uh, and look forward to uh, the improvements that they're proposing to make. Thank you, Ms. Esty. Anyone else? Um, no, there are no other hands up. There was a hand up, but it, oh, here we go. Yep, R. Scott Mitchell. 
Oh. Okay, well, if there's no more comments, let's bring it to the council for deliberation. Anybody wish to speak on this item? I have a quick question for staff. Uh, I can't ever recall a variance for the construction cost calculations that exceeded 80%. Is this something, that, is this a first? I believe we've done this before. Have so we yeah. Um, if if I may, yes. Um, I believe it's been done on multiple occasions, but in the staff report, and I can pull it up if you like, I believe we referenced 124 Central Avenue, which um, was thematically similar to this project. It was also a historic house. I believe it's the, the Purple House, as you may know it, on, on Central. Um, and they did receive uh, a variance for the construction cost calculation. Maybe I wasn't on there. Maybe my memory's failing me. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Haven't we done away with that in the uh, new ordinance? Well, we tried. We tried. We didn't. <laughs> we didn't succeed with yeah, that section okay. of the we ordinance <laughs> in the Costa Commission. So <laughs> this is the new method. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Any other comments, or do we well, hear a motion? I mean, we've. Uh, Grants and variances uh, of all kinds due to historic preservation. That's mm -hmm. one of the main reasons that we do grant variances. So, uh, and this is an unusually shaped lot. Yeah, mm -hmm. it, it meets all the requirements. The minor modification is very minor, uh, like one foot in length and one foot in width. Fine thing. Yeah, I, I think it's nice that the applicant um, redesigned the project to address the concerns of the historians and um, set it back behind the roof line because uh, now it really does look like it fits on the property itself. So uh, I'll make a motion to approve the project with uh, the staff finding and con findings and conditions. Second. I have a motion by Commissioner Westman and a second by Commissioner Ruth. Are there any other di discussions? I have no comments. Uh, can we have a roll call vote? Commissioner Christensen? Aye. Commissioner Newman? Aye. Commissioner Ruth? Aye. Commissioner Westman? Aye. Chair Wilk? Aye. Motion passes unanimously. Congratulations. Good luck on your project. Thank you. <laughs> Let's move on then to item C, 2022 zoning code amendments. Um, we'll pick up where we left off, I guess. Yeah, thank you. Um, this evening we have Ben Noble of Ben Noble Planning um, to finish up where we left off. We are not going to go back and over the whole presentation. Uh, we did want to uh, suggest that we open the public hearing early and then we'll talk through the last, the remaining four items. Um, so would, would that sound like a good idea to open but the public hearing. Do we want to go back and uh, do the presentation on the items we didn't talk about, which was? You know, at the last meeting, Ben presented all of the items, so there's only a few remaining. And Ben, if you, if you wouldn't mind just maybe listing what those remaining items are, and then um, we could open the public hearing on those items and then go into the discussions. Yeah, that's a good idea. Uh, can, you, can you hear me OK? Yes, Ben, we can. Yeah. Great. All right, so um, just a little refresher. On October 20th, we had the first um, hearing of these amendments where the Planning Commission provided direction on the first five topics of interest on our list. And um, what staff is requesting tonight is direction on um, the remaining five topics of interest as well as any other um, items that the Planning Commission has comments on with the amendment um, with the request to uh, pro make a recommendation tonight to the Planning Commission or to the City Council for them to adopt these amendments. And what we had in mind for the meeting tonight is um, starting with number six, EV charging stations, um, that I would go over the slides again that I presented uh, two weeks ago, and then um, have planning commission dis discussion and direction on that item 
and then move on to the next one, generators, I would review the proposed amendment. Planning Commission would then discuss and provide direction and so on and so forth until we completed the list. I think we thought right. that that was uh, a sensible way to proceed tonight. And I guess we wanted to check uh, with the Planning Commission, and Mr. Chair, if that sounds like a good approach. I think that's a good approach. Um, we also have to have the public hearing on each item. So, yeah, why, uh, so that's the question. And you suggested we do it all at once. I suggest we do it topic by topic. Sure. <laughs> we okay. have one attendee on Zoom. Okay. 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 Uh, I have a question. Didn't we talk about electric vehicle charging stations? Because Commissioner Newman talked about how we ought to have something in there that makes it work with state law. I, I, thought, we left, I thought we left the park. That was the ADUs. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Ben, go ahead then. And we did All right. Excuse Great. me. But I'm we sorry. Did go talk ahead. About charging stations because we talked about the size of the screen on them, didn't we? We did. And yeah. he showed us the thing where they were using the screens for advertising. Right. And was that just part of questions? We just Maybe asked quite what we, we interrupted and asked questions when he was talking about that. So we didn't <laughs> have our discussion. Is what oh, I okay. Okay. So go ahead, Ben. Electric vehicle charging Great. stations. Okay. Thank you. So the existing code has language about EV charging stations and it requires charging stations for new uses with at least 25 parking spaces and additional remodels that increase an existing parking lot by 50 or more, uh, that has 50 or more spaces by 10% or more. So the existing standards are for large parking lots with a lot of spaces. And if the um, EV charging station requirement is triggered in terms of the number of uh, charging stations. If a lot has 25 to 49 parking spaces, um, one charging station is required. And then an additional charging station is required um, for additional increments of 50 additional parking spaces. So again, um, we're talking about very large parking spaces in, or, or uh, parking lots in shopping centers. And what the uh, proposed amendments say is that uh, the number of EV charging stations is required as required by the building code, um, as that's something that evolves over time. And um, there's also language that limits the size of digital screens to two square feet. And there's language that requires screening um, of parking lots on lots with six or more spaces um, if there's an EV charging station as would be required for any parking um, lot. So nothing unique or different or uh, additional for um, EV charging stations. And so there are alternatives that we've considered. Um, it is possible to specify in the zoning code the number of required charging stations um, to make sure that's consistent with state law. And then expecting that state law will evolve over time with the building code and the green code, um, the city would then need to periodically amend the zoning code to make sure that the two are consistent. Uh, another option for the city is to codify um, the required ministerial process to approve a building permit for um, uh, the EV charging station that's something that's uh, required by recently adopted state law that cities need to approve these charging stations through a streamlined ministerial approval process. The language for that, if a city does codify it, is typically in the building code um, and can be very detailed. And I think our uh, preference and recommendation on this is to not codify that process and instead rely on uh, state law uh, to, um, to establish that, and reference that. So, and part of the reason why um, these proposed amendments are coming before the Planning Commission tonight, particularly about the uh, digital signs, is that uh, there does seem to be kind of emerging interest within the advertising industry to use these EV charging stations as um, uh, an opportunity for electronic billboard signs. Uh, the city has previously received inquiries 
about whether or not this is permitted and what the approval process would be. Um, and as I previously mentioned, a staff's recommendation is to uh, limit the size of digital screens to two square feet um, as a way to prohibit uh, the sort of large digital display advertisements that um, we're seeing in some communities and that are of interest to the advertising industry. So with that, um, I would sort of stop my presentation on EV charging stations and uh, turn it back to the panel. Okay. Yeah. Without deliberation, are there any questions on his presentation? So now we can move to then uh, the public, if there's any members there of the public. There are no longer any attendees <laughs> on <laughs> Okay. So let's bring it then back to the commission and uh, any comments on this item? I did want to mention um, we did approve an EV charger, two EV chargers, I think it's two, there might be a couple more, at the mall at Macy's. And they are the large screens. And um, at the time of approval, it wasn't clear that they'd be utilizing those also for advertising. So I just want to highlight that there are two that w would be non-conforming as soon as we pass this ordinance. <laughs> but um, And that's what we're trying to prevent is they can put Pete's Coffee on there and other advertising. We can, um, at some point, notify them all and enforce our sign ordinance on those. So there is a way, but we're just really trying to avoid this situation from happening again by for the two uh, square feet of I don't understand the, the uh, objection to the advertising. I, I think well, if you don't like advertising, then just ban it. You know, no, no two by two foot screens at all. Just we don't like advertising. Or well, if you, you like it, why not go, what the heck? Well, you do need a screen <laughs> because when you go in to charge, you've got to utilize the screen in order to... Uh, operate. Seems I, like see, I see, so, I see, I yeah, see. Our that's sign ordinance issue. would actually govern it uh, if we were capable of enforcing our sign ordinance, which I know is difficult. I'm more well, concerned about the technology. If people find it lucrative to have the big screens, nobody's going to make a charger with a small screen so you won't be able to get one, <laughs> and we'll just have a variance every time someone wants to install one. So I, I don't even think we should put that provision in there. You don't. You want the big screen? No, but I don't. I don't think we're going to have any control over it. We're at the mercy of what the manufacturers produce. Right, but I. I think that the manufacturers are going to produce ones other than the big screens because there are going to be a number of places that are not going to want to have the big screens. Not only us, but uh, no, you're, no, not, you're, you're not going to see. I don't the think big it screen. hurts anything to put it in there. I just think we're going to get a lot of variance requests when people okay. can't get that I mean, type of charger. I think we ought to go along with staff's recommendation on the size of the charger so we don't have the big screens for advertising. I think we ought to incorporate the Cal Green standards so for the number of stations that need to be, we can, uh, you know, someone can always put in more, but that way we don't have to keep going back and changing the ordinance. And I think parking lots ought to be screened the way we have established screening parking lots now, we shouldn't change it just because some of the parking slots are going to have charging stations in them. So that's my opinion on the three points. <laughs> well, I agree with all of those except for the uh, for the uh, screen size. I don't have a problem with it with a big screen personally. So, Ed, uh, I'm with uh, Susan. All the way. Okay, Courtney. Um, I, I think I'm favoring the small screen too. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well I think I think that's direction enough. Okay. So that's staff recommendation. Should okay, Ben. All right, let's move on to generators. Proceed with generators. All right. So um, generators. We're talking about. Um, uh, generators for uh, emergency power during power outages, and the existing code is silent on this matter. And the city has uh, in the past received um, uh, questions about this, and also there have been uh, installations of generators. And uh, clarity on the rules that apply to generators is something that is uh, would be beneficial. 
So the proposed amendment um, would prohibit generators in the front and the side setbacks of a property, but would allow generators to project uh, five feet into the rear setback if necessary um, to locate the generator behind the rear building wall. Um, there's also language that limits testing hours to 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. and would also prohibit freestanding generators to supply service to recreational vehicles or trails. Excuse me, Ben, what does testing hours mean? Does that mean running hours? So that's, that's the time during the day when a generator can be tested. And um, periodically, a generator does need to be tested. It's actually a requirement um, of the generator to do that periodically. And um, what we're saying here is that if, when it is tested, it can only occur during um, the time of 8 a.m. But it could run 24 hours yeah, a day. I don't get that at all. Well, I think well, they it, test it them once typically I think needs to run for about an hour is my understanding. We're just saying that you can't, you can't test a generator during the evening. I mean, I can tell you every month when they test a generator here at City Hall from my house, I can tell you every month they test a generator at Shatterbrook. And why shouldn't they do that testing during the daytime rather yeah. than at night? I mean, if the generator needs to run, it can run all night, but. So the testing is noisy? I know nothing about these generators. Yeah, I, I think I, I brought up the generators once before. We actually have in our neighborhood a home that's put in a commercial size generator. And it is so noisy when it runs that um, it's difficult for people in the neighborhood to sleep. I mean, it's, it's loud. And so my concern about the generators was I thought we ought to have some noise standard for them or require them to soundproof them because we do now require on commercial developments for people to soundproof their generators. Um, and it seems like in a residential neighborhood, there ought, there ought to be some consideration about noise and soundproofing. It's not, I'm not real concerned about where the generators go. I'm concerned about the noise that they make. And so again, let me just pull the thread on this testing thing. So testing is a extra noisy it's thing? It's a maintenance or? requirement. No. It, testing is a maintenance requirement that happens. I'm just wondering time. why would you the flag is, this as anything special? The, the point is, is that in an emergency use of the generator, you don't have any choice about when you do it. But right. testing, you can do at a time that doesn't annoy people. You can choose when to test. If I see. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. That makes sense. Yeah. But I, th I, I mean, I think it's nice that we're starting to address this issue, but I don't think this is really a very good solution to the generator noise disturbing the neighbor issue. Uh, just like uh, Commissioner Westman says, I mean, so we can put um, levels, acceptable levels, uh, requirements on there. So within our general plan in the uh, residential district for an occasional disturbance that may happen in a residential district, the, the um, allowance is between 60 and 70 dBLs. So we were thinking that if you would like to put and limit on this, suggesting 65, and then it'll come at a greater cost when somebody goes to the store to buy their generator, um, and we tell them it has to be a 65 dBL. I, I think I found one online today that was about $1,400, but, uh, but you can get a much cheaper generator that's probably very loud, so. Um, and you can yeah. get generators that are very quiet. Yeah. I mean, my neighbor on one side of me has a generator and you hardly hear it when it's running. Um, so I do think it would be nice to have some sort of noise standard in there. Could you, could you, could you limit it to say when there's power outages? And, you know, that's, I would think a lot of people are doing it just because they're worried about, you know, when they lose PG&E or whatever, they want the generator to kick in. It's when the generator runs for three or four days straight and it's no one can sleep and it typically happens in the summertime when it's hot and people have windows open. So, so those people aren't just responding to a power outage, they're just using it 
instead of no it, it would be typically Pedro it's power, power outages and around uh, for days we've had we had one I, I don't think it was last summer the summer before in our neighborhood that went for four days oh well, i guess i've been well, fortunate uh, <laughs> i think uh, given the uh nature of capitola and, and, and the density of capitola we should have a noise maximum for sure could we incentivize sound proofing, like uh -huh. providing some type of bunker or putting it within some, you know? Right. I've if they buy a noisier one, they could sa they can soundproof them. Yeah. People, I've known people to bury them in kind of an <laughs> underground bunker, and it provides a lot of soundproofing <laughs> in their own purposes. But I have a question on the just the language of the rear setback. So, if it's a non-conforming house that has a ten-foot setback, are you allowed to put? the generator within that area? Um, it says five feet into the rear setback. So if if the lot is 100 feet deep and there's a 20 foot setback requirement, it would have to be, fifth. it could only go five feet into it. So there'd still need to be 15 feet okay, between the property so line and the. So it's the legal required setback, not the, not a non-conforming setback. Correct, okay. yeah. yeah. Probably could cl clarify that on there. Yes, yeah. So I would be happy with it if we put in the 65 and said if they can't meet that standard, then they need to put in some soundproofing. I would agree. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. Ben, did you hear and that? Another, another suggestion um, that I think I heard was to add language that limits the use of the generator to um, power outages, e excluding the testing, the mandatory maintenance, um, um, to prohibit somebody from using the generator for an extended period of time during periods when there is not a powder, power outage. Would the Planning Commission like us to add language along those lines? I think that would be a nice addition. I agree. Can we think of anything else that somebody would need the generator for? I just would hate to limit somebody that needs I, I think it would yeah, be wise house. to to <laughs> add language about an emergency or power outage. I, you know, yeah, you could you could add some language that in an emergency or a power outage because something could happen at their particular home that Correct. requires uh -huh. all the electricity to be turned off, and they want to run a generator to okay. you know, keep their refrigerator. Yeah, the emergency so is a little a little broader. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think um, typically a couple of the applications that we've seen for generators that come through in through building were be for medical reasons too, that if the power were to go out, right. people who have medical needs, so we want to make sure they're protected. Yeah, absolutely. Now, do people who just want to add a home generator for emergency need to come and get a permit? They do. They As come in and get a building it. permit. So that's when we would. No, not quite. You only need it if you're putting in a system where the generator kicks on automatically oh. if the power goes off. Uh, a lot of people in Plug my it. neighborhood have generators that if the power is out for a while, you just run the generator and plug yeah. your refrigerator mm. or whatever you want to keep running into it, and those don't need okay. building permits. But those aren't applicable to this. No. Those are portable generators. So for portable generators, we don't have a permit requirement, but we could still have a sound requirement. Sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And they can't put them in their front yard. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Is that enough? So if 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 we were to do that, we would want we would need to um, make that clear in the That's in the amendment. Because I think right the way it's written right now, it's really for home generators that provide backup el electricity in case of a, of a power outage. Um, so if, if, if we want it to apply to these um, portable generators that could be used for other purposes, we'll, we'll need to. Well, portable generators are used in construction and all kinds of things. So are we going to control that too? I mean, I, I think we should just limit it to built-in generators and permanently installed. 
Well, why don't we start with the built-in generators permanently yeah, I think this is a work in progress. That, that's a good place to start, and if yeah. we find the others a real problem, we'll add those in too. Okay. Sounds good. Okay. Uh, do you, would you like me to review the direction on this, or are we good to move on to the next topic? That would be helpful to hear it back. Okay. So the direction is to add uh, a noise standard, so 65 decibels at the property line, and if the generator exceeds that, um, uh, it needs to be soundproof to meet the standard. Uh, we will um, limit the use of the generator to uh, power outages or emergencies, and we will clarify that the rear setback is um, five feet into the minimum legal setback, not the uh, existing building length. That sounds right. That sounds right to me. Okay. Okay. Great. So um, we'll move on to minor modifications, which is timely since you had uh, that on your uh, agenda previously. So the existing code allows um, with a minor modification, deviation to a physical dimensional standard, such as setbacks of up to 10%. But there are other types of standards which are not eligible for minor modification. So it's a limited, limited use and availability, and it requires planning commission review and approval. The proposed amendment is to allow for community development director action on a minor modification if the project does not otherwise require any commission review. The idea behind this being that if the project um, involves this uh, minor adjustment to a setback or other similar dimensional standards and it would not otherwise need to go before the planning commission, um, that this is something that could be uh, acted upon at the staff level. Could you give so, us an example? That, yeah, sure, because th this is why we are proposing this. Um, we had an applicant um, actually in the Upper Riverview Terrace neighborhood come in, wanted to do an addition that would not require planning commission review, a small addition off the back of the home. Um, their garage interior space is substandard, so I want to say it was at like 19 feet 2 inches. In order for them to move forward with the project, I could not uh, allow a minor modification, so therefore it would have to go to the planning commission. So um, minor modifications are allowed for up to 10% of a measured, uh, it can be a setback, a driveway dimension. It does not include height limits, so I could never do a minor modification for a height limit. It also does not include like density limitations. It's really about measurements within a site plan. Um, and if you wanted to even just make it really specific to just parking space dimensions that I could sign off on, that's another way to approach this. If you always wanted to see if there was, like if someone could come in for a 10% minor modification to the front yard setback, and if you wouldn't want me to be able to make a decision on that, then you could specify exactly what that permission could be, but it, it can only go up to 10%, so. Is there ever a circumstance where you would determine that that wasn't an appropriate use of that 10% at so the back it, level? Um, yeah, I think so. There, if, there, if there's a streetscape in which all the houses are set back at the 15 feet, I feel like that's really asking for a variant. You know, it's, it's almost in that variance area. Um, and I also, the way it's drafted, I could bring it to planning commission. So if there were one that I didn't feel comfortable with, that I didn't really think it qualified as minor, I could bring it to the planning commission. But so if someone wanted on a 40 by 80 lot, instead of a 16 foot rear setback, a 14 foot setback would be a minor modification? They, it, it's only up to 10%, so it would be like they could get a one foot <laughs> deviation, a little over a foot. So, so it'd be a well foot and a half. of 20 feet would be two feet. Yeah. So instead of a 20 foot setback, it would be an 18. 18. Mm -hmm. So they could ask for that. But, but, you, you but they can come. I mean, like the, the one that was on Riverview, um, 
It just came on the consent calendar to mm -hmm. the planning commission. Yeah, so. Doesn't seem like. My, my concern about this is, uh, especially with setbacks, is occasionally these are issues to neighbors. And it may just be that they're using the setback because there's something about the change that they're not too happy about and they want to. So if it's just an administrative decision, a staff decision, the neighbors really don't get any input in it or opportunity to be heard. So uh, I'm kind of would prefer just to limit it to the parking issue. I think that's wise, yeah. I could go along with just limiting it to the parking issue. Yeah, my concern is we we keep embedding in our zoning ordinance all these avenues and yeah. end runs yeah. around our requirements. No, the best one was uh, Dennis Norton's building down there at the corner of Sto uh, Stockton, and where they it was taller than uh, there was no variance, but it was something to do with the mechanical equipment or something. Yes, Remember yes, that? yes. Some deviation. It was the some lighthouse. other. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Okay, so, so driveways. So, so just the dimensions just of a parking space is what I'm saying. Dimensions hearing. of parking spaces, limit it to that. Otherwise, it stays the same. Comes to the Planning Commission. Sounds good. So to make sure I had this right, so this list here, which you may, hopefully you can see okay, this is when a minor modification is allowed. And what we're saying is that um, if, if it's for number one here, mm -hmm. and there's no other need for planning commission review, mm -hmm. the director could act on this. Yes. But yes. all others would need to continue to go to the planning commission. Is that correct? Correct. So when you're okay. adding community um, benefits and minor modifications, and yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the project just keeps growing and growing. All right, um, so are we good on minor modifications? We can move on? Yes. Mm -hmm. Great, okay. So second story decks and balconies. Currently, a second story deck and balcony requires a design permit. Uh, and um, the existing code prohibits upper story multifamily decks and balconies when abutting R1. And this is part of the newly adopted objective standards for multifamily and mixed use residential development. And also the existing code excludes second story decks and balconies from the floor area ratio calculation. And the amendments that are in the packet tonight um, include new standards for second story decks and balconies in R1 and RM parcels abutting R1. The standards address orientation, minimum property line setbacks, maximum projections from the building wall. And there's also language um, with some changes to the FAR rule. And the packet amendments um, would include in the FAR calculation a second story deck or balcony that is covered or enclosed on two or more sides, um, but would continue to exclude the second story deck or balcony uh, from the FAR calculation if it's uncovered and open on three sides. So, for example, this uh, balcony deck um, in this photograph would be excluded under the, um, in the FAR calculation. And so, um, following um, the uh, proposed language being shared in the packet, uh, staff has thought about this a little bit more, received some feedback, and we would like to present to you a slightly revised recommendation on this issue. Um, uh, one of the revisions is probably the, the biggest change to what is in the packet is, and hopefully you can see this okay, uh, A on the screen, which would revert back to the rule um, in the old code uh, prior to the, uh, to the adoption of the updated code. And, and what the old code re, um, uh, required was that um, if a uh, uncovered upper floor deck um, and a covered exterior open space 
if it's more than 150 square feet, it would be included in the FAR calculation. But if the deck or balcony is less than 150 square feet and it's uncovered, um, then it would not be included in the FAR calculation. So that, that's um, uh, part of our revised recommendation tonight. And, and why did you revise and it? And then the other. I'm just, oh, I, I can answer that. Um, I don't think we had as many issues with upper story decks under the old code. And I think that's because they counted towards your floor area ratio. The new code, the upper story decks don't currently count towards your floor area ratio. So I think bringing back the old standard of just capping the allowance at 150 square feet, um, Otherwise, it counts to towards your. What well, was the rationale for removing it uh, decks from the floor area ratio to begin with? The original was to allow more articulation in the buildings and more uh, variation in the form and design. But what we're finding is the impacts are on the neighbors are, are large, and they they tend to be doing larger decks in the rear yard so that was why I suggested that maybe we just go back to the way we used to do it because we didn't seem to have as many mm. proposals for really large decks so mm. yeah, so the problem it really is this this is one of the most conflict ridden issues we see as planning commissioners because one neighbor wants a deck and the other neighbor wants privacy right so this doesn't really address it head on, but you're saying that the it, former ordinance seemed to work better. It, it, having a limitation uh, related to FAR helped. So we're, we're not only recommending A, we're recommending A with B and C. So also, uh, Ben, if you, if, and we'll have Ben walk through B and C. But so it's a new package of let's put a new FAR limit on it that allowing uh, up to 150 square feet, but then also um, a rear yard setback of 25% of the lot, a front setback of 20 feet, and then on the in interior and exterior, a 10 foot setback. So it actually has to like step in further away from the so neighbor's properties. Are there any illustrations of what's allowed that we can look at? There we go. So, <laughs> so the, the uh, <coughs> applicant comes in and meets all these standards and the neighbor comes in and says this is an invasion of my privacy so are we under this new proposal if the, the applicant meets the dimensional requirements does the applicant have the right then to have that second story deck it still requires a design permit in which there are uh, privacy standards in the review of a design permit so it gets us right back in the, the same problem. But it does, I, I like the idea, I mean, the thing that bothers me about the whole deck issue is it's so subjective. And you know, it's like, well, I think it really is gonna bother that neighbor, it's yeah. not gonna bother this neighbor. You know, we approved one up on Depot Hill because, you know, on the Fonses house remodel, because well, it was sort of there and so I, I would like to see us, I like the idea of coming up with some standards which says, you know, if you meet these standards, then you're entitled to have your deck. If you don't meet these standards, then. Um, don't okay. we have to take the design aspect out then? Um, for the design permit or? Well, I mean, uh, I sort of agree with what Commissioner Westman's saying is that if you meet the requirements that we're gonna enact here, you have a right to your deck. So yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but, uh, but you were saying, well, well, there's still design permit and design permit gives the planning commission discretion to deny it if they feel like it because the neighbor complains. Well, just be, wouldn't it be just like anything else, like a, a, a 25 foot height requirement? Well, you meet that, it's good, but we still go review it and say, oh, I don't like that, I'll look at that house. It's contextual. Yeah, you, <laughs> you, you, design review still looks at the d overall design of the house, but 
I don't think it's, I think they would have a pretty good argument, like I get to be 25 feet tall because that's what I'm allowed in this zoning district. I get to have my deck because this is what I'm allowed in the zoning district. I think it would make it clearer for us all. Help me a lot, you know, in terms of reviewing these. Are, is there specific criteria for the privacy? Um, there, there is criteria for privacy in our design permit, um, but it's not, it's not like objective standards of you can't have a deck within 10 feet of a window or any, you know, it's right. not it's that. It's pretty vague. It's very, it's just to protect privacy. I just, so, I just, it seems with the increased setbacks, it seems it's trying to limit the line of sight to, you know, curtail neighbor conflicts, but it just seems kind of unfortunate if you have two houses that are backing up to each other and nobody cares if they have the second story deck and then they're limited by that. But ordinance. I think it's, you, we have to look at the long term. It doesn't matter who lives there right now. What matters is, you know, long term because houses change hands all, all the time. It's, you know, what kind of standards are we gonna have in our community as far as privacy and decks go, not I mean, you shouldn't get what you, your neighbor objects. You shouldn't, you should be able to have your deck if you meet the standards. Your neighbor doesn't object, doesn't mean you get a much bigger deck. Mm -hmm. Solution is to ban second story decks. Oh my gosh. <laughs> <Yeah>. So, <laughs> <laughs> I've, I've got a question on this so, slide. Yeah, for this, for this slide, um, at the top of the slide is the street, the main street. This is a corner lot, and then there's the side street. The, the box that you're seeing is what would be allowed for this, like the, the allowed setbacks for a second story on a building. So what you're seeing is what the footprint of the second story of the building could be. In the hatched area, that's where the deck could be. So the deck on the second story can go as far as the structure on the second story for the front yard uh, uh, facing the street and then also the side street yard. But then there's an increased setback between homes of 10 feet so the deck couldn't be right out where the at the wall where the second story is allowed to extend to and then in the rear yard your rear yard requirement is 20 percent for a setback and the deck would be at 25 percent so they'd be more inset mm -hmm. um, under this ordinance if, if we were to modify it this but way so I'm confused here are we allowing then if they meet the requirements second story decks on the interior side of a lot that faces the neighbor? They, um, but they would have to be inset 10 feet. So they couldn't be within 10 feet of the property line. But you could still have a deck on the side of your house on the second story. It applies to roof decks. I'm That's sorry, okay. Ben, could you, is the first, do we have um, language in there also that it can't be faced towards the interior lot line. It can't face the interior lot line. I thought we had that in there. But that, yeah. that was yeah, in that there. Was, okay. That was a, that, that, that is in the packet um, language. Uh, I think what, what we're coming to you tonight with is an alternative recommendation to eliminate that okay, um, so statement, which we're concerned is problematic. So that, that probably should remain in our recommendation, that first item, I'm sorry that I didn't clarify that earlier. So I think the idea was not to allow decks on interior sides. So in that diagram, the only place that a deck would be allowed is either on the front or the rear, correct? Or the exterior side or along the, exterior the street. exterior if they were on a corner on lot. On a corner lot. Oh, no, wait a minute. So then that, that, doc, that diagram is wrong. So you can't have a deck on, that's a lot line, right? That dash line on the left? Right, you can't, mm -hmm. we're so saying yeah. you can't have a deck on that side. Well, it says you can. Oh, I see, because it's a, da a dash line. Uh, okay, yeah, 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 that makes sense. So if we bring back that A, which says you can't face the interior side, you couldn't have a deck along that between two homes, but you could have it off the back of the home Right. or any face looking towards a street. And was that requirement still in there that requires a, like a rear yard deck, second story deck to be set back within that second story, to have, have walls on the side of it to protect the This This would essentially 
get you there. It would be more inset because mm -hmm. it has greater setbacks and it has a greater rear yard setback, so it would have to be inset. Um, it doesn't say specifically so they're not required, that. But the potential is there. The potential is there, yep. So wait a minute. So let me pull the string on that. So uh, the, you have a rear, uh, second story balcony in the rear. And let's see, we, we're limited with the square footage, I guess. So it can only go six feet out. Is that it? Yeah. So in other words, so you, you couldn't inadvertently have one facing the neighbor because you'd only have six feet on the side that would fa potentially face it. Yes, off the back. Off the back. Okay, I get it. What I'm do you think about requiring on that interior side of a rear yard deck a, a six foot wall to protect that privacy looking towards the other property? If, if uh, you're requiring walls, doesn't that count against you towards FAR requirements? Right. It would just be on the. It would just be on the one side. Well, I guess it would be on, on both sides because side. if it was, because if it was a middle house in the middle yeah. of the lot, middle of the right. block, you'd have to do it on yeah. both sides. And so then, would that count that against your FAR because you got walls on both sides? It it, it won't make a difference with the new 150 square foot exception. Yeah. So. Okay. Uh, you know, I you're. To me, I'm, I'm not the, the one who compl complains about second story deck, so you guys need to decide whether or not they have, you need walls. <laughs> I, I agree with you that the, to um, encourage visual um, obstacles so you can't see your neighbors is a good idea. I just really disagree with the, the whole FAR counting it into the massing of the home, just because if you provide all these limitations for increase setbacks and you know obstacles visual obstacles i feel like that's a, a lot of requirements and then actually trying to pull the square footage out of the home to compensate for you know outdoor space it just seems um i don't know you're losing a lot of what the home could be you know so you're gonna reduce the size of your bedrooms or the bathrooms to then you know allow yourself a little bit outdoor space that you're already providing so many obstacles it you know provisions for your neighbors but if you were designing a house for yourself mm -hmm. right that was it that would be a decision you'd have to make right. where that do you want to utilize the space i totally agree with you i just I, all I, my only prerogative is that when you have 2500 square feet to work with say and you ha and you get a 150 square foot credit to put on a second story deck and I think that was actually not just 100 square, 150 square feet, but that counted any outdoor space, like an enclosed porch or anything we in the previous code. And so you had to distribute that 150 square feet in all these different places, and it really ran out quickly. So now we, you don't have a lot of area to work with for the second story deck or any outdoor space in general. So I just kind of felt that trying to pull it out of the house is is really taking away from the charm of each design. I think for me, I, I'm comfortable with 150, you get 150 square feet. If you go beyond that, it counts in your FAR. So the 150 square feet On is- On the second story or all? Is, is free, right? Yes. The That's way yep. you're proposing it's it. Second story or does that include patios? So Ben, can you, Pull up the 100. Okay, so uncovered oh. upper floor decks and covered exterior open space in excess of 150 square feet is included. Like upper floor porch. deck. Yeah. I mean, we could add something about front porches not being included well, if, in the. If the FA. 150 square feet could only be used for the upstairs of the second story deck, I'd, I still don't like it, but I think it's still a, that'd be better than trying to split it with your front porch and your upstairs deck. That's not really what it says though, A, is it? Yes, but that they're, they're referring to a previous code oh, and that's the previous code, you know, specified that you had to, you had all these different places to put it. I mean, for me, 
you know, I'm, I'm somebody who could go along with Commissioner Ruth and just ban second story <laughs> decks because I think they're, I, I, I think they're a problem in Spain. Uh, and, you know, I'm particularly in Capitola with the size lots that, that we have, I, I really could go that way. So I'm trying to step back from that a little bit and come up with a scenario that for me will provide some assurances of privacy and setback for the neighbors, uh, will sort of put the planning commission in a place where we won't be deciding you know, individually whether they should or shouldn't or do we like this house or not like that house. Uh, it takes all of that out of it. We're going to have, you know, a set of rules. This is how it works. So, um, I, uh, uh, for for me to go along with it, I I think we would need to keep A in there because I, we don't want people building enormous decks, which, you know, um, some someone might decide that that's what they want to do. Um, and I don't think there should be decks on the interior between houses. I don't think 10 feet's quite enough. And, um, you know, the, the, the other standards work for me. And I'm not, in all honesty, so concerned about having a wall put up because um, I think that Katie's right. It, it will evolve that way because it's got to be set back in the, in the building itself. We've required that in the past. Up on screening, yeah. was it McCormick, Loma, one of those it houses was up recently there? Recently on Monterey, Monterey. Yep. We required that. I just think that should be a provision in there. If you're going to have a rear deck, it needs to have privacy walls. Okay. I I can go. I mean, I can I can go along with that. Okay. Yeah. I, can look at that. I, I wouldn't go along with that, but <laughs> I think I'm a minority about the decks in general. <laughs> well, I, I tend to agree with, with Courtney in, in terms of the second story deck is, is, a, is a great feature, not only architecturally, but living space. Um, and, you know, the, the, the notion of you having to limit that and, and take that out of your, your floor area ratio, that, that kind of limits your design. And, and you know, if people don't like decks uh, because you can see in somewhere in their backyard, you know, I don't, grow a tree or something, you know, <laughs> I, I just don't, you know, you gotta live with yeah. people. We're, we're split all over the place here because this is a irreconcilable conflict between. It's okay, there's compromise, there's, okay. A, there's a compromise. I, th I think that if, I would be okay with the way that it's written if we can just make sure that the 150 square feet is dedicated to upstairs de or level. Second story. Thank you. Decks. <laughs> just because, um, just to make sure that upper floor decks. Yeah. Yes. Just so it doesn't get. To be clear, in the in the past, um, the covered exterior open space, we d we would utilize this towards first story, covered porches. So to Courtney's point, a lot of times when you're doing, when you're trying to utilize this exception and max out your FAR, it's hard to, you know, right. so it's what, very limited. So, so what she's asking for, the way I understand it, is that the 150 square feet uh, can be for an upper uh, second story deck and we would have an additional 100 in square feet for features like front porches, is that? In that, in my interpretation, I'm sorry to beat a dead yeah. horse. But, um, in my interpretation, I just feel like this is important for the charm of Capitola, and that's where, in in designing houses in this town, it's you want to have that th the porch, you want to have the rear yard, you know, overhang, all those things, and you don't want to be limited on that by taking space away from the actual living, usable space inside the house. Right, so if you add it, so really what you're doing is you're, we're adding an additional 150 square feet that's not going to be counted. So you could do the front porch or and on that, and you still have 150 square feet for your second floor deck. I, I don't know if there's a, if, 
limitations on the first story just doesn't seem to make sense. But but the second story, if what we're talking about, if we can allow 150 square feet, that's what I'm saying. Um, Ben, are you suggest? Did you just make a revision to? I did just make a revision, and um, I think there may be. Let's see. And I wanted to see if this this is what the majority is leaning towards: uncovered upper floor decks in excess of 150 square feet is included in the FAR calculation. Right, so we're not dealing with front porches. There, there are no whole. We're just dealing with balconies and decks right now. Front why, would, why would we allow a deck of more than 150 square feet, since there's such a problem? Well, what if you had two upper floor decks on two different sides of the home? You can't have them on the sides of the home. And that size, I'm sorry, but like different, maybe a little bit in the front, a little bit in the back, if that's where they're allowed, hypothetically. You can do that. It just you uh, can do that. It's FAR. just that if they exceed 150 square feet, then it gets down into floor mm -hmm. area ratio. Yeah. Right. Well, do we have to worry about massing at this point? I mean, how, 150 square feet is that a, a, a lot? A lot? Is it six feet the max that that can? Yeah, it, it's six feet. So, so like 25. That right? Six feet six by twenty. So that's one hundred twenty. You know, you could get like a like a. So the all setback way across area, the back second story is four feet. About one. Yeah, it's feet. twenty five. So it could be twenty five feet wide. So it's twenty five foot wide deck by. But if you think about if you have a front deck. Also on the front of the home. But yeah, it's it could be a six by twenty five. A oh, backyard deck. Just backyard if, you say if you want to put it all in the backyard. If you want to put it all in the backyard. It could be 25 <laughs> by 6 feet. Or it could be that. 12 by 12. <laughs> but it can't but be. But it has to be set back, so. And it's it's it, halfway into your house. <laughs> it's it's going to take up your whole house. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it has a larger setback than the rear wall, so. So it can't extend beyond that hatched area then, is that correct? That's correct. Correct. Okay. Correct. Okay, and we need to change on B number three because they're not going to be allowed at all on the interiors, uh, side yard between houses. I would say leave it just so that we make sure on the backyard there's that inset of 10 feet. So if they're extending, but we'll, we'll add a point about that they can't be facing the interior side right. yard. I like the 10 foot setback in the rear yard. That's a very good point. But we need to say that we don't allow them between houses. Correct. I added, I added the language that's in the packet. I think what I'm hearing is to make sure that this stays in the amendment. Let's see. The second story deck or balcony may not face an interior side parcel line abutting the lot with a single point. I would still like to include language about privacy walls, but I think no. I might be in the minority. No, that's okay. No, we could go with privacy walls. I think you got yeah. three people who go with oh, privacy okay. walls. Could we, could we go so far as to say it remove the, the word uncovered? Could it be covered? Because it could be argued if you have privacy walls, maybe you would want to incorporate it into the massing of the house if it's set back so far into the setback. You mean if you cover it? Yeah, like if it's if it's set back into the setback it, or increase in, into the massing of the house. So you just extend the roof line over it? Just a little bit so you have like, you know, a nice sheltered area that's partially shaded or if you put a trellis that's connected to the deck, I mean to the, um, to the house that could be considered covered. If we remove the, the uncovered word and it just says upper floor decks in excess of 150 square feet, that would make it so it would be more incorporated into the massing of the house. Yeah, and I we could incorporate privacy yeah, panels. Yeah. Okay. Is that okay?
Ben, did you hear that? So for point A, to remove the word uncovered? Let's say we have the upper floor decks in excess of 150 square feet is included in the FAR. Um, the following setbacks are required, 25% on the rear, 20 on the front, interior and street side, 10 feet. Second story deck or balcony may not project <coughs> further than six feet from the exterior building wall to which it is attached. Could you blow that up so we can read it? Yeah. <laughs> Do you want to add something about privacy? No, I just... Yeah, I yeah. wanted to see if there was anything in there on privacy. Yeah. A second story deck or balcony may not face an interior side parcel line abutting a lot with a single family home. And then um, privacy screening shall be required along the interior side. Screening? That could be somebody putting up a couple plants. No. Or, okay, so a privacy wall. Yeah. Privacy wall. Yeah, is required. So frosted glass wouldn't count? That's not a wall? That's a wall. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> That's a so wall. privacy wall required in wall. which circumstances? Required um, on the side of the deck along the parallel to the interior side parcel line. Uh, I would right, think like privacy screening would be okay because I... I what about a tr what about a trellis? If you had a, a you know, a, a, a one of those crosshatched trellises could on each side. Put up a couple potted plants and say that's a screen. Well, that, so the screen would be something you debate, and the staff would say that doesn't count because yeah. it's not part of the structure. But a wall is not debatable. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I'm not in support of that, but uh, maybe a minority can. Oh, not How in support about of wall. privacy screen? I could, I could, privacy screen would work because then we would have to, they would have a permanent privacy screen. Okay. A plant's not a permanent privacy screen. There you go, permanent privacy screen. That way it gives them a little, a little leeway so rather Tell me what that would look like. What's a permanent privacy screen? It's similar to the application on Monterey that we were, they were proposing privacy screens, right? They, they had one, I think they had several examples one was um like a trellis one was a a, a glass that you couldn't oh the opaque, opaque glass. glass but i do think it needs the word permanent because i, I hear your point with uh, plants mm -hmm. well, like louvered wood or something is usually a popular um, mm -hmm. And it would be installed, so. Okay. Okay. Are we going on second so story decks? <laughs> no, we're not. So, so um, <laughs> in, in what case? <laughs> it, it's for. Can we open the public it's hearing. For <laughs> <laughs> so this is this okay. this we're, is right now. We're just talking about R one and multi residential. Right? Is, is this we, a, we haven't gotten to talking about decks and roof decks for commercial correct, projects. Correct. Okay. And when you say the interior side, when we have a lot that's in the center of the block, I don't you need a different terminology than the interior side? Well, there's street side and interior side. So in the middle of the block, you're going to have two interior sides. Okay, they're both so called then interior. They would, yeah, okay. so they would both have the screening. I, I think it's important for the screening requirement to um, tie that to a rear deck only. Because mm -hmm. on the front deck, we're right. not saying. Yeah. Oh, good point. Mm -hmm. So for, for rear deck... great to see this in a PDF, but um, so for a rear deck that is um, facing a rear prop, uh, parcel line abutting a single family dwelling, is that when a privacy screen is required? Yes.
the, a permanent privacy screen, for example, opaque glass, is required for a rear deck facing a parcel line abutting a lot with a single-family dwelling. I, I, I don't think that quite captures it because I, I think it's the screening is be supposed to be between the neighbors, so it's for that adjacent property line, not like on the back of the deck, right? It's right. not to face. So it's it's on the side of the deck so that you can't look into your neighbor to the side. Do you guys want to wordsmith this yeah, later? Yeah, we can. Okay. I, I've got it. Wait. In a, uh, Katie, you it, got it? Yes, but it, it has to be on the side of the deck. It's not on the rear portion of the deck, so. Okay. I'll, I'll send it to you. If, if you can send me this, I'll okay. send you a, an edit. Um, okay, so I guess we, does that look reasonable? Yes. Okay. Yeah, yeah I think we're real close on that. <laughs> <laughs> All right, are we ready to move, to move on to roof deck? So how, how are we doing? Are we okay? Can we keep, can we keep going? Is everybody okay with that? I'm fine with All that. All right, let's, let's keep, keep going. going. Okay. All right, so roof decks currently require a design permit. Can you blow it and up a in little the bit? Oh, sorry. Sorry, I was... <laughs> okay, there we go. So currently requires a design permit, and in the newly adopted objective standards, uh, roof decks are prohibited um, on multifamily uh, development that abuts R1. And so the proposed amendments add a new roof deck definition and um, would also prohibit roof decks in R1 in any parcel abutting R1. Uh, would require five foot setbacks from the building wall closest to the would allow for railings to project above as a maximum building height and um, limit structures within a roof deck only to structures that are needed to access the building. So that's the that's the proposed amendments, and I can I can pull them up uh, on the screen as well if we want to look at them. And what one question we had here is. In the village, this comes up, there's a few roof decks, and I've heard concerns over the years about the roof decks. Um, safety, we've had code enforcement calls, and also from the Planning Commission of whether or not to be able to you know, design with a roof deck. And right now it's not protected in, in terms of, there's other area, if there are areas of town that you would like to prohibit roof decks, um, it would be appropriate to know that now. One item that I do want to raise is that in the hotel design that we did see for the hotel in the village, there was a second story roof deck that would be, in my opinion, very appropriate. So I think if, if, if there is a desire to prohibit roof decks, it might be good to tie it to residential uses or make an exception for hotels because that, um, I don't know, that was a tiered deck that came down that was a nice element that I'd hate to prohibit that yeah, in a future that was design. that what they claimed is a community benefit that was built over yes. public property. Right, <laughs> yeah. So yeah. I, 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 have a, I have a couple things. First of all, um, you know, we, we are prohibiting these um, next to an R1 mm -hmm. district, and we just approved a hotel uh, up by the post office that's next to an R1 district with a roof deck. So, um, uh, you know, and if you look at our zoning ordinance uh, for the uh, commercial areas, uh, an amazing amount abuts R1 districts. I mean, you look at Capitola Avenue, Capitola Road, everything abuts an R1 district. So we're really saying that you so know. you might as well approve them for R1s as well. You can't. can't. No, I don't want to go there oh, either. Okay. <laughs> um, and, you know, we talk about the hotel and the village and the, the second floor deck that they were proposing to me was not a roof deck because it was not a deck up on the roof. 
And the last thing we want to do is have a deck on the roof of that hotel, because then it will really impact the people who live on Depot Hill above it, who are very concerned about the height of the hotel to begin with. So um, I'm sort of talking in circles, but I, th I don't think there should be roof decks in the village. I don't think they, they, they work in that area. Which is an R1, so we're not really dealing with that as it's written. So, but, he, but she asked but if, if but there are other areas. But we're, speak, we're no. saying that you can't have any roof decks that abut next to an R1 district. So, yeah, I guess that, that's fine with me, though. We did just approve one. And um, uh, she asked about the village area. Um, I, I have a hard time with them in the village area because it's so congested. Well, I'll stop. I, I'm trying to think. I, so I kind of overlook the vi village, uh, and I, I'm trying to think. I'm trying to. Man I can't imagine any roof roof decks. I don't see any. I think the oh, remodel down at the end of Terrace Way just had one. Yeah, there are roof decks down there. But that's Terrace Way. Is, an, is that R1 or is that the CV zone? I'm not sure. Terrace. I that's thought R1. Terrace Way was the central village but residential overlay district. Mm. Mm -hmm. So how about Riverview as you get closer to uh, Stockton? Isn't that uh, CV? It's CV until you get to um, Trestle. Yeah, so there's a lot of, I mean, that, that makes yeah. sense. Do we want, uh, so they're okay there? The way this would read, that fix would be okay, and there are several. Yeah, I, I, I'm not in favor of roof decks. Can I ask you know, why? What, like, what is the, I mean, sure. not that I actually don't, I don't yeah. know. Um, I think that uh, roof decks have a potential to carry noise a long distance because they're up high. We all know, you know, noise goes like that. Um, I, I don't see, um, uh, you know, I, I don't see a reason to have them on very small parcels that are so close together. Uh, I, I think they're, they have the potential of being a real noise issue. And, and it is our nightly rental zone. Okay. So that, that factors in with noise and, you know, it's basically a hotel use down in the village for all the residential so to allow rooftop vacation decks. rental, vacation rental, yeah. Yeah, yeah I mean, I, I think we're 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 addressing it in the air in not the most important area, actually, of the of the city. Um, I don't know if I'm for them or against them, but if we're going to prohibit them, it seems like the area we would prohibit them in would be in the vacation rental areas. Mm -hmm. That's what I was kind of alluding to is just it's so if they were prohibited in the CV zone allowed in the other multifamily residential zones but not those parcels that abut R1 zones I don't know, is that a problem I'm not sure <laughs> the the other suggestion for the abutting R1 zones is that you could say that they need to be oriented towards the street kind of similar to what we just did so that the rooftop deck and in the example of the hotel also it, it wasn't um, oriented towards the R1, it has to be. I mean, personally, I think the rooftop deck that we approved on the hotel is gonna ultimately be a problem. It's gonna be, you know, coming back, because you, you can't have it there and not have noise for the That's residential done. neighborhood. I bet it's never utilized. <laughs> <laughs> so let's take Cliffwood Heights. I mean. That's what we're addressing in terms of you can't have a rooftop deck in Cliffwood Heights, but that's the one place where nobody has a rooftop mm -hmm. deck or, I mean, right. it's not an issue. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So no one objects to this. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we don't even need it. So th this is fine with me, except I don't think it deals with the village, and I think we need to deal with the village. Just add a prohibition in the CV zone. And that works for me. How about everywhere? <laughs> That's fine with me. Fine with me. <laughs> I don't think we need rooftop decks. And I think, yeah, I just. 
That's fine. I, I didn't, we just should address it in some form. So okay, that, no, that's no, what no, we we're, we're talking yeah, Well, I, I, we really want to just, I think we're being a little hasty here. We're, we're, <laughs> we're talking about our residential. I think we can all kind of agree that in the residential zones, it's yeah, you don't want a rooftop deck. No, I can't agree with that. Yeah, it's close by high school is my example. And you you think rooftop decks are okay What's there? What's wrong with it? Yeah, six thousand square foot lot. A rooftop. Okay. Nobody well, does it because they don't. You know, they have backyards well, and. So that, I mean, my point is that oh, we're, we're discussing the R1 zone and now you're saying, well, should we be concerned about all these other zones? Well, I haven't, I haven't really thought about all those other well, zones. The, the roof decks, we're not talking about R1 zones, are we? No, we're no they're not allowed. We're they're not allowed well, in the It's R1 more for your, for your multifamily. We're talking about the multifamily and commercial zones. You know, I kind of like the idea of, of, of looking at it case by case. You know, like you, like you pointed out, we approved the hotel. Well, why did we? I mean, we looked at it and said, well, that's a, that's reasonable to have a rooftop deck there, and it but it abuts a residential zone, and it's so uh, to, to to have a just a, a blanket statement that says they're uh, they're prohibited just is inconsistent with how we've ruled in the past. I think if you take my suggestion just to add a prohibition in the CV zone, that probably accomplishes what we need to accomplish. I agree with that. I could live with that. So just prohibit in the CV zone? And, and leave this in place here the way this is written. So it's not next to an R1 zone. It's not next to... It's not in a R1 zone as well in an R1 zone or next to an R1 zone. Or the CV. Mm -hmm. Okay, so Ben, is, is that consensus from everyone to remove yeah. it from yeah. the central village? <laughs> <laughs> oh. Or not? Uh, it's a big change, but I'm in favor of it. <laughs> I won't object. Or mixed use village. It sounds like the direction is the amendment as proposed with the addition to prohibit roof decks in the mixed use village zone. Yes. Correct. Got it. So that that concludes the items that we highlighted. Um, I think we also wanted to provide an opportunity. Um, for there to be any additional discussion or comments about any other um, proposed amendments that we did not highlight. I only had one, and that was that, um, now I've lost it, I had it out here. Uh, the map that shows the Riverview Terrace neighborhood, uh, just have it right here what did I do with it um, uh, it's I think Katie can find it for me we talked about this earlier. Yeah. I saw it just a few seconds ago. I thought just a few seconds ago it doesn't match the um, oh here it is um, page number uh, page 5 of 143 or page 203 I don't know which one it's um, figure 17.16-1, oh, yeah. Riverview Terrace. Yeah. Uh, I just think this map should conform to the single family zoning. Uh, you'll notice um, there's a lot on oak where <laughs> it comes in. And I walked up and looked at that property. I don't particularly know why that jog goes in there. Um, so I would just like you to look at this map and see if it can be cleaned up so it's more consistent to the okay. boundary line. The little jogs didn't make any sense to me. There are quite a few of them. Yeah, some. So 
Well, there's a couple parcels on Capitola Avenue. I know that one, that little indentation, that's all one parcel from Capitola it's Avenue. N it's not. It's it not anymore? It's not anymore. And um, there's a little apartment complex here, but it accesses off of Oak. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I think there's three sort of little so units right there. Uh, yeah, it's, it's not anymore. And I think the same thing is true with this sort of jog down here. Um, uh, I, you know, this is off the river. Why does that jog in there? Because down here. Where's blue going? Uh, so we can just give, can we give staff an action just to review yeah, that? Yeah, just to review the map mm -hmm. and make certain it's accurate. Okay, figure 17.16-1, yep. Okay. Our map specialist has taken notes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Let me, let me take a look at that. Okay, any other, other items? Other zoning comments? It's a broad question. <laughs> Nothing yeah, pass, now. pass for now. Okay, <laughs> let's move on then. <laughs> Let's call that a wrap then and move on to oh, the- Oh, wait, 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 I got one uh -oh. more. <laughs> um, on page 53, uh, there's a comment about uh, planting of invasive species is prohibited, talking about, you know, landscape planting. And my question was, who's gonna determine what is an invasive species and how's that going to be monitored? So I think we should either take that out. Um, you know, we talked about in other places we suggest native landscaping and that, but since there's no official list of what is an invasive species, I think a lot of people consider ivy an invasive species and it's planted all around town and, and others. So uh, that was on page 53. <laughs> I think that should come out. I agree with Deacon very much. <laughs> <laughs> and I actually had a couple more, but. In, in, in Carmel, they won't let you pl plant agave cactus. <laughs> I thought that was interesting. Agave cactus? Yeah, they said it was invasive <laughs> anyway. Yeah. Everywhere. <laughs> yeah, you know, I think if you don't have a list, an official list, then it gets a little vague. You have to hire a biotics person. So that I'll shut up. Thank you. Peter's well, I do have a particular grudge against English uh, green ivy, but uh. <laughs> <laughs> we all have our plants we don't like. All right, let's move on then to the, the director's report, item six. Okay. So, um, oh. so I, I want to make sure I have the invasive species. So what 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 page and section is that? Okay. Well, I fifty three. Fifty three, but that was on the original it, packet it, we got. It's in the landscape section because we moved all the information on landscaping to the one section. I think it came out of our coastal overlay zone. So um, it's a red line in the landscaping. Uh -huh. And it's page 50. Is it specific for the visitor serving property? It, it was, but we, we put it in our new, the, when we consolidated everything okay. into the landscape chapter, it shows up there. Okay. So there's a, there's a statement that says the planting of invasive plant species is prohibited. So the direction is to remove that sentence? Correct. So uh, I, I don't have page 53 here. Could you just, so the idea here is <laughs> no one can, the, the idea before was that you anywhere in the city of Capitola you're not allowed to plant a non, uh, an invasive species and no. now we're removing that. No, what it was was that the Coastal Commission had required in the Coastal Visitor Serving District there be the statement that no invasive species uh, are allowed. And when they consolidated the landscaping, they took that from the Coastal Commission's oh. requirement right. and now made it a city requirement and I'm saying I don't think we want to have that requirement. I, okay, I understand now and agree. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Yep, the sentence is, the planting of invasive plant species is prohibited, and we're going to strike that. Okay. Okay. Any other clar points of clarification that you need, Ben? 
No, but um, do we need a uh, the planning commission to take action and make a formal recommendation? We do. We need a formal recommendation um, to yep. take your recommended changes to the city council for first reading. So we need a motion to uh, um, recommend that these comments be forwarded to the uh, city council? Yes. I'll make that motion. <laughs> so. Okay, we got a motion by Commissioner Westman and a second by Commissioner Ruth. Let's have a roll call vote on the recommendations to move these to the City Council. Commissioner Christensen? Aye. Commissioner Newman? Aye. Commissioner Ruth? Aye. Commissioner Westman? Aye. Chair Wilk? Aye. So now can we move to the director's yes, report? We Let's can. do that. All right. Okay. Item six. So first, this is a little bit out of order, but I did want to introduce Liliana to you. Liliana is our new office coordinator at the front desk and just a great asset to our team. Um, our previous deputy city clerk decided to move on from the city, so she's helping us out while we're um, doing a, a recruitment. And so Liliana, thank you for being here tonight. Um, and then for my director's report, I have a quite a few updates for you. So this week, we kicked off the housing element and hosted stakeholder meetings. So we had a series of eight meetings over the past two days via Zoom, and we had really some really great participation from our business community, real estate community, local housing advocates, uh, a lot of different groups. So um, got some great feedback on what our biggest issues are regarding housing in Capitola and suggestions of where housing should go. Um, so I will be bringing the housing element like kickoff to the Planning Commission and the City Council come January of next year. So when the new council is seated. Uh, second update is there's a new revenue stream for affordable housing. It's called the PLHA funding. It's the Permanent Local Housing um, Allocation Funds through the state. This was part of SB2, which passed, uh, I think, I want to say back in 2019, might have been 2018, but there was a $75 real estate transaction fee that is attached to all real estate transactions. and. The state has been collecting that money and it looks like our first three years of collections have been great and it's almost adds up to a half a million dollars for the city of Capitol. It's for real estate transactions that happen within your city limits. So we um, next week at city council will be um, moving forward with applying, but that money can be used for 10 different types of affordable housing projects. We're suggesting that our city council uh, put that towards being able to produce more affordable housing and so that with this new funding stream we'll be ap actually be able to work with our local nonprofits and developers and provide some funding to help them with affordable housing projects in the future. Um, third is our pre-approved ADU designs. Mm -hmm. We now, it went through the building process and it took a while of back and forth going through the building review and getting um, them all up to code. We now have five approved building approved ADUs. I updated our website yesterday. There's now a new ADU page. So on the left hand side, you can click on the ADU and uh, there's the, the new guide is available as well as the five pre-approved pre ADU plans. So thank you for all your work on that. Um, let's see, on our next meeting, December 1st, I'm gonna be bringing to you uh, at the director's report, I'll have an arborist report regarding the tree out front of City Hall. It's doing a, quite a bit of damage to the sidewalks no and <laughs> threatening the building. <laughs> <laughs> I will say it's one of my favorite trees because it sh gives me great shade in my office <laughs> and it will be missed. But that sadly we have to bring that forward to you. But I'll be providing an arborist report at the next meeting. Um, and we'll also be looking at the calendar for 2023 at our next meeting at City Council. We'll be asking whether or not they would like an earlier start time, earlier than seven. So that's something I'll also be asking the Planning Commission. So if you just think about that over the next month and I'll be asking if you'd rather meet earlier. 
And last, at our last meeting, we talked about paper. And with these really large items wanting paper, I did want to get some feedback on plans. In the past, we used to ask every applicant to bring in seven copies of full-sized plans, and we would distribute them to your houses with the agendas. Since COVID and going digital, we've only required two sets of plans, so there's not as much paper in our office anymore, but it's really for your benefit. If you'd like to be looking at the large plans, we're happy to make that a requirement again for planning now that we're back in person. I would say the only concern I have on the digital ones, mm -hmm. when you go to expand them, at least on my iPad, on my iPhone, they won't let you do that. They revert back or they flip over. Right. Mm. So you can't expand them to look at detail. Yeah, I have difficulty reading them sometimes because they're so small and I can't, I keep trying to make them bigger and I, I can't figure out how to make them bigger. In Are you the both on iPads or? Yeah. I have, I have, I, I use an iPad and a Mac Pro. And I, on, I, neither one of them can I get it to make them bigger. So I don't know if that's just the format they're being sent to it that, you know, if I could blow it up so I could look at some of the details, then I wouldn't need the big paper plan. Um, I don't so think, I don't, I don't need all the plans. Okay. I mean, if I have a problem seeing something, I can come in and look yeah, at it. Yeah, yeah. There is, um, when you're on our website, there's a couple different ways to access the plans and let me just, if I can show you really quickly on Zoom. So when you're um, in on our website, if you go down to agendas and minutes, Mm -hmm. And here, I'm going to put Planning Commission. So there's different um, packet types. There's the agenda packet, which is, this will be a PDF. Right. If you go to this HTML agenda packet, this is where we all like to go just to get directly to the staff report or the exhibits without having to scroll through the whole packet. So anything in blue you can highlight yeah. and then look at. Right. Have you been to this? You've been using this? So is, I was hoping that maybe if you go directly to the plans, it would alleviate the issue because it's not tied to the whole agenda packet. So I would suggest trying that, but have you, it sounds like you've already been utilizing. You know, I, I, haven't, I usually go to the packet through the email that gets sent to me. Okay. <laughs> So, yeah. So then here on the HTML, you you'll have the option mm -hmm. to really zoom in or zoom out. So okay. No, that's okay. good to know. That'll help. Okay. At least help me. And then we are trying to resolve that if you do a a query for the uh, zoning code or the muni code, um, that that would come up more easily. I'm also going to show you this when you're at the city website. The muni code is here as a button. Right. So, the and I don't know what the on my phone. iPad is when it comes up, the buttons are below the, the screen, visual. the visual. Mm -hmm. So, until Mick pointed it out to me, I know I'm slow. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't. I didn't even know the buttons were there. It, it used to be at the top too. So this is recent. They update. We updated our website more recently. So that's something I can bring up to our. Yes, yeah, it just if the size just went down so the button showed <laughs> when it comes mm -hmm. up like yeah. on an iPad, mm -hmm. it would be <coughs> helpful, I think. Okay. Thank you. That's it for the director's report. This so evening. the so the answer is we don't need full size drawings. No. no. Perfect. Okay. okay. And that's the director's report. Now, uh, last minute commission communications. No. No. I think we finally made some headway <laughs> for roof decks. <laughs> I really believe this might solve all the controversy. Sure, we'll never have a problem with decks again. We're and with try. that, we'll adjourn. Thank you.